welcome to API documentation for our diverse communities or international communities. Um, so as is customary in Australia, I'd like to make acknowledgement of country. I'm speaking you, to you from the lands of the Wundudri people of the Kulin Nation. And I wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners. I'd also like to pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. So a bit about myself. Um, as I mentioned, I've been, uh, I've been around a few decades as a developer relations advocate, paper cut software. Um, what's relevant about that is, is that I write a lot of content for our partners in Asia. So that, that's folks in uh, all, all over Asia, uh, South Asia as well, as well as, of course, America and Europe. Um, so I'm always trying uh, to make uh, the documentation um, accessible to these peoples. Um, I'm really super keen on technology. Uh, and I also, because I live in Melbourne, we, we think we make the world's greatest coffee. So I'm a bit of coffee stuff as well. Um, if you've got any questions, then I, I will be dropping off fairly soon to go back to bed uh, after I finish. But if you've got any questions, um, feel free to ping me on Slack uh, if anything occurs to you or reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, and I'll do my best to answer when I get up. Um, my preferred pronouns are, are he and him. Um, so why, why do I think this is important? Why am I here talking to you, to you today? Well, the money we invest in writing uh, our API documentation um, needs to have an ROI, return on investment. And if, we, if people don't understand our API documents, then they're going to increase our support costs because they're going to start asking questions and, and getting frustrated with us. And in fact, if they get frustrated enough, they're going to stop using our API. Um, so that's kind of a problem. We, that's, not, that's not what we want to happen. Um, and of course, understanding um, is greatly impacted by the individual cultural characteristics of the people who are consuming uh, the content that we write. Uh, so that's why I think this topic is particularly important. Now, I'm going to say something pretty silly, really, and I can say this is an easy problem to fix. All you have to do is to write content with intention. So understanding what it is that you want your users to get out of your documents, having a clear idea. And when you do create that content, do it with empathy so that you think deeply about how people are going to understand and consume your content and write it so that uh, as many people as possible can understand it. Unfortunately, of course, that sounds that sounds all good, but it doesn't actually dial down some of the dive down to some of the details about how to actually make that work. So let, let's look at some of the details. So first one. Let's, let's go back and look a bit about uh, culture. So culture sort of has lots of different dimensions. So the society in which we grow up, the family in which we grew up and the, and the person in which we are obviously is unique. And so, you know, we have individual values and expectations around that. And then when we start working, the team and the organization in which we work also has their own culture, and their own way of doing things. So all of these, play into how we as individuals consume and understand things. So let's look at uh, some obvious ways that we can identify culture. So the obvious thing is the written spoken language, uh, and that's generally where people stop, but that's too simplistic. So there's a lot of different ways that people behave and they understand that is infected by the culture in which they're in. And I'm not a social scientist, but if I should have preface this whole this whole thing by saying that I, I don't consider myself an expert. This is my personal opinion, based based on my own experience. Um, so, you know, feel, feel free to to take this with a grain of salt and, and put your own interpretation on it based on what happened, what, what what happens in your world. But these are sort of the general the general things we can we can uh, talk about when we talk about culture. But in software development teams, there are additional cultural um, aspects. So the way that people behave and understand. So the way that they actually perform the product development sort of processes we do, two examples would be uh, a team that is, two extreme examples would be a team that does agile development and a team that does waterfall development, for instance. And teams have relationships with their customers. Sometimes those relationships are very close. Uh, they're very aligned their customers, they respond directly to their customers. Other teams are more distant from their customers and that affects the sorts of com communications that you can have with, with the 
these developers and the types of the types of conversation go on. Different teams have different domains of expertise. So, for instance, if you're dealing with an organisation that is developing uh, accounting software, they will use different terminology and have a different way of, of viewing the software development process than because people who are writing a messaging application, as an example, two very different ways of approaching something. And underlying all that, of course, is the rather obvious point that te the technology choices and the technology platform that the, the team uses. So I've been talking about API documentation. What do I mean about API documentation? So often when people talk about API documentation, they talk about API references. Um, and I'm going to come back to that. Uh, but that's not enough. There needs to be an awful lot more around our API documentation. So for instance, <clears throat> traditional technical writing uh, what I call expansionary text needs to include a lot more, it needs to help people get started. It needs to discuss a wide variety of topics like, like um, security, API security. Uh, we need sort of task-based explanations of how to get things done, uh, troubleshooting guides and so on. And the other thing that I'm always very keen on is sample code. And again, I'm going to talk about sample code in a bit more detail later on. But let's talk about the expansionary content uh, uh, first. So actually, I'm going to talk about this very much because already there is a wide variety of uh, information out there on the internet that you can read that explains the details of how to write good explanatory text, how to lay it out, um, how to structure your sentences, and so on and so forth, as well as looking at uh, resources that are specific to global audiences, you should also look at writing accessible content. So that's content that is available or dyslexic and so on and the, and the more accessible you make your documentation then the more it easier it is for global audiences to understand as well whose first language may not be the same as yours um so yeah a lot of a lot of this is uh, of this talk will be uh, look at these references that you need to go and read later and there'll be more references as we go through one important thing um is that we took a technology choices. Uh, so here's an example. Um, the, uh, the audience that, are speaking, that you are speaking to may or may not be familiar with the technology that underpins your API. Um, now, you don't want to clutter up your documentation, your API documentation with supplementary detailed explanations of particular things. So you need to create some supplementary material that can be um, consumed elsewhere. So as an example, um, we have an XML RPC, we have some XML RPC um, technology-based APIs. And for some people, that's something they've never come across before. So I wrote a blog post about that, and, I, and people can read it if they need to. People who already understand that, they don't have to wade through streets of content in the main API documentation. And you can actually get secondary value from this, for instance, because uh, for this, in this particular case, uh, this is one of our most popular blog posts. So we got additional web traffic by creating this extra explanatory content uh, designed for the people who have not seen our stuff. As I've just noticed in the chat that somebody's having trouble seeing the slides. Okay, not everybody. Right, I'll carry on. Okay, uh, creating APIs of specific content. So previously I talked about you know, uh, ideas and concepts that can be applied to sort of any technical documentation. Let's look at the, the API specific aspects to it. So first of all, use more diagrams. So in the English language, we often say one picture is worth a thousand words. To me, a diagram illuminates 500 words. So the important concept I want to talk about here is that um, diagrams are useful, first of all, because they allow you to illustrate relationships between things. Uh, they allow you to, uh, to document uh, in an easy to consume fashion, the sequence of APIs and events, because often API calls have to be performed in a particular sequence, and it's important to document that. Um, and also sometimes workflows and work processes. So these are three sort of diagram types that I've found particularly useful. But the thing about a diagram is that it doesn't replace the text. It's a supplement to the text. It supports the text. It makes the text easier to understand, but you still need to write the text. 
Uh, so this concept of it's it's the alt tag for the text that you write. Uh, you need still need to, you still need to provide these complete explanatory explanations of what's going on. And remember that not everybody can actually read um, your diagrams. So people who use screen readers, for instance, they need adequate alt tags on all the images, and their screen readers need to be able to read the text and still get the meaning from it. So don't skimp on that. Um, there's quite a good section in the doc. In, in the book Docs for Developers, Engineers, Field Guide to Technical Writing, Chapter 6. Uh, so um, there's a link in there if you want to get a copy. Um, here's an example of a simple diagram. Um, it's not a particularly good example, but I just wanted to, to show something small. Um, so again, we're trying to uh, and references between the two. So this is the numbers. One, two, three, helping people relate one to the other, that type of thing. Um, this particular diagram is generated with a tool called Plant UML. Uh, and the benefit of using a tool like that um, is that you can actually, it's very easy to do because the diagram is described in a text based format. And then you can just generate the, the um, content very easily every time you republish your, your uh, documentation. Um, I also use, I've started to use Mermaid UML as well. Uh, that's also worth looking at depending on, on the publishing format that you use. Um, other media. So of course it's, it's very tempting to, to put in uh, images and screenshots and, and videos and that sort of thing. But, you know, as with, as with in other areas of technical documentation, there are problems with this. Um, Again, accessibility is an issue with, with images and, and videos. Um, they're much harder to keep updated. So the diagram, that wasn't a problem because it's just text that we can edit, but with the images and screenshots, you have to you know, you have to generate generate them. So they're hard to keep updated when things change uh, and they're hard to translate. So that's kind of a problem, uh, but they are still valuable. I still use them because sometimes they're a huge shortcut. So if this is, if there's a complex setup procedure to get your API development environment set up, then having a short video that shows people the steps, the, the, the steps that they need to do, the buttons they need to push in an IDE, that type of thing, sometimes you just can't read a video. But again, remember that you still need to provide an accessible text-based version for, 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 for some of your audience. Uh, and also images, for instance, can, can highlight uh, or relationships between information. So a good example is where your API, the API is, for instance, supplying information that is then displayed in the user interface. So you can actually uh, make it easier for the for the consumer to understand the importance of the information and where it's going to appear and what it's going to look like. So, so invariably, uh, you have to use them, but use them with some care. Right, so if we're writing for international audiences, surely it's easy. We can just put it through a translation machine or through a translation process. Historically, that's been quite hard. Um, you know, first of all, you know, technical documentation, particularly for APIs, changes quite frequently. Sometimes, you know, every week, um, particularly if you find uh, problems. Um, manual translation is quite time consuming. And if you're engaging third parties, expensive. Um, it often makes uh, sense with, with um, sort of user manuals because they don't tend to change so much. And the audience is much wider, so there's greater value. But with technical API documentation, it's, it's often quite hard to justify that. Um, you, should, you should investigate the use of controlled natural languages. Um, so controlled natural language is quite an interesting co concept. It came from the defense and aerospace industries. And the controlled natural language actually consists of two just distinct parts. One is a vocabulary. So it's the limited, it's a small limited vocabulary you're going to use. Each term is very clearly defined. Um, so, uh, People know exactly what it means. And the second part of, of, the, of the specification uh, is the way in which the language is used. So the types of structure, the sentence structures, and so on and so forth. So once you have that, you are really constraining the way that you produce descriptive content. Um, and that makes it easier for people to understand or, or even for machine translation to occur. So machine translation uh, is, is sort of become the, the, the panacea that everybody thinks it's going to work. I've done some experiments in the past, not recently, and it's not been really good enough. But your mileage may vary, so it's definitely worth trying for your particular documentation. 
And something to be aware of is that whatever you write, people are going to take it and cut and paste it to Google Translate as well. So it's probably worth trying that for yourself to see if you can understand how well your content is translating in, in sort of these end user tools and, and if you can actually improve or change the words to make that translation better. It's something to be aware of. It's actually quite hard to do. Let's talk about API reference content. So this is this is a screenshot of some API reference content. Um, it happens to be from our API documentation, but there's nothing special about it. I just was too lazy to go anywhere else to get a screenshot. Um, and it's, this is generated using uh, Open API specification, which I'll talk about later. Um, and it's rendered in a web page uh, by a third party tool. It's actually read up in this case, but there's several of them. <clears throat> the thing I want to draw your attention to really though is, is that this is a highly structured piece of content. Um, it defines exactly, in this case, for instance, the API methods that you can call or an API method you can call. It defines exactly the HTTP responses you can get back in this case and the structure of the JSON payload that goes back. What I can't see in this screenshot, show you the screenshot, but this is actually interactive. So, um, for instance, there's a little plus sign down here. And if you push that, then that will expand to a full description of the JSON content <coughs> and so on. But um, also notice that there's, a, whoops, there's actually um, textual descriptions. So obviously somebody's written this. This is not just uh, automatically extracted information. People have written this text. Uh, and that's, we'll come back to that later. Um, and so I mentioned earlier on that often, unfortunately, developers assume that if they produce some of this API reference content, then this is an adequate description um, of their API and it will actually, and that they will allow their, their, their partners to be successful. But as I have explained, that's not always the case. And it's particularly not the case for people from diverse backgrounds. So how do you generate this, this stuff? Just, just a bit of background. Um, so often network APIs, for instance, uh, can be generated from what are called specification files. Uh, there's a few examples here. So the one I just showed you was, was a RESTful API, uh, which was using the open API specification. Uh, you may know this is Swagger, by the way. It's, it's historically been called Swagger. Um, there's also, tool, also if you use technology like gRPC or GraphQL, then they have, oh, they have their own their own specification formats. Um, GraphQL uh, actually allows you to add content, uh, comments, which a lot of people don't seem to realize, which actually makes your documentation a lot richer. Um, I, I, mentioned, I mentioned XML RPC briefly before. Uh, you have to write that one by hand. So that doesn't make me happy, but uh, you just sit down with some and write markdown tables. Um, but uh, we'll talk about that in a minute because, because there is a way out. So as well as having specification, you know, for, for network APIs, there's often a specification format that you can use. If that's not available, so for instance, if you're using a non-network API and it's just, you know, you're just code, um, or you're using something like XML RPC, then if you have if you have the server code, uh, you can act, you can often generate API documentation from that. Um, different tools have different constraints. Uh, for instance, the Java doc tooling seems to produce quite complicated, hard, hard to follow API um, uh, uh, API specification, which is only really useful for for Java developers. So, so the result, you know, that's true for all of them. Um, so, depending on the tooling that you're using, uh, you you have different options, uh, but you may find it's constrained. But it, uh, it may be the fallback position for for what you do. And we've certainly done it for some of our APIs. Having said all that, API docs still need the input of a technical writer or a technical technical writing review. So, you know, hopefully you've got an API style guide, uh, and you should apply that style guide not only to your descriptive text, but to your API reference documentation as well. So, make sure that you that your names are descriptive and consistent. Um, now. By the time as a technical writer, if you get involved at this, uh, you might it might be too late because a lot of this might be already implemented. But ideally, you'll be early enough to make a difference with things like naming. Uh, make sure that there's consistent use of terms and explanation. And most of these, um, in fact, I, I don't know of any that don't. 
all of these um, reference formats allow you to add descriptive text, which I, I, I kind of talked about earlier on. So make sure that you're applying the same standards uh, of, for clarity and accessibility to the description of the summaries inside your API reference that you apply to all the other, other information. Inline code snippets. So these are quite common. Um, inline code snippets just are small fragments that possibly even appear in line with, with your documentation, showing individual API calls and response payloads and that type of things. Um, I would treat them the same way as the diagrams. So they don't, again, they don't replace the text, they support it, they help explain it. They're extremely important. You should definitely have them, but unfortunately they're often overused because um, people assume that they are sufficient unto themselves. Uh, unfortunately, um, they don't provide a full a full, full amount of information. So the obvious thing is that, you know, they don't explain, uh, if you just do the snippets and, and have minimal descriptions, then you may not be explaining um, the values or significance of the return payloads. You're not providing the larger context uh, around how it's used when it's not, when, when this particular API call shouldn't be used, for instance. So be, be judicious uh, and careful about how you do this. The, um, the snippet should support and enhance your text, not replace it or um, subsume it. A lot, of, um, a lot of guides is providing complete working code solutions. So rather than just providing snippets or a few fragments saying, well, you make this API call and then this API call, have a source code repository from which people can download um, a complete working solution. So this is all about showing me, just don't, don't just tell me. Uh, there's a couple of good reasons for doing this. First of all, <clears throat> you might find that it just answers a lot of questions, so you don't get so many support calls. Uh, or taps on the shoulder um, because people can actually see how it's meant to work, and it also builds confidence uh, in your with your partners that they can that, that they can do this because they can download the quick the working solution, get it set up, have it running, show that the technology works. <coughs> excuse me, show that a current develop that their a current development environment works, and all they have to do now is implement their own solution on top of this. Unfortunately, um, you implement these solutions in a language like Python. I, I, I choose Python, uh, but that you may find that a lot of that that's not that a lot of people aren't able to use that. But at least if they can download it and run it, they know it works. Um, and if it's a language like Python, which I ch I choose, um, it, hopefully it's understandable by a wider audience. We often create uh, some level of frustration because, for instance, if you produce a C sharp version or a JavaScript version, uh, then those two communities often don't kind of understand each other's code or don't seem to want to. Um, so there's often requests to do it differently. Um, in an ideal world, you would produce different different samples in all these different languages, uh, but realistically, it's it's quite it's quite hard. You, you need additional resources, and there's always more things to do. So you have to have a trade-off. How much? How much to do it, but having at least one working example. Uh, I also find the working examples <coughs> are useful because if somebody comes to me with a query and says it doesn't work, I said, "Well, have you got have you got the working example running at least?" And that's that's uh, um, that's kind of allowed a lot of people to get up and running because they just assumed they could write something from scratch and they did it. It didn't work, but if, but if you go back. To the working example and get that running instead first, then you can compare and contrast. So it's quite good for support and stuff. Um, you don't often the audience uh, will not feel confident enough to download and run the example, so you have to prompt them. You have to point to it in the in the getting started guide. Make sure that your sample includes is 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 a useful example. So you know things like session handling, what to do when things go wrong, when you get different uh, HTTP statuses back. Um, not just simple requests, but complex API requests. So, you know, larger payloads, uh, payloads that represent bigger problems in the domain space, that, you know, and, and, the, and the larger payloads that those, those return. Um, and show the complete life cycle of the API solution. So not just how do I achieve this information um, or how do I set up this user account, 
but how do I how do I set up the ABA security? If you're using like uh, OAuth machine to machine, then there's some API calls that have to be made when the solution starts up, so that it can actually obtain uh, a bearer token for security reasons. So you need to to sew the whole thing running from beginning to end. Um, and also, ideally, how it, if there are special requirements for deployment, also any, de any deployment requirements as well. And write some decent comments. Uh, particularly important, of course, if you're only providing, for instance, uh, a, a version in JavaScript, um, then adding comments could make it accessible to, to people who use different technology. Remember, technology is a cultural choice. OK. Uh, some bonus content here. So this is not specific to API documentation, but but you know often I'm, I'm speaking with um, you know having written the documentation and encouraging people to use it. I'm actually speaking then to the to development organisations, uh, and I found that that there can be some conflicts or some misalignments between the way that different organisations communicate. So we consider ourselves at Pipcut to be to be agile. So you know we deliver our content online. We frequently update it. Um, I do tell people we're updating it. I don't just make updates. But um, we do continue, in, and around that we do continue iteration and continuous improvements. Um, and you know, I, I start I have Google groups for for our community so that I can tell them about these changes. I try to engage with them, get them to ask questions, that type of thing, share knowledge. Um, having got these communities, then I expect people to then start pulling the information rather than me having to spoon feed or push it out. Other people work in a different way, and that's not necessarily wrong. It's what works for them. Um, so they value stability rather than frequent change. <coughs> they want clear signals. Uh, getting an email is 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 not necessarily, uh, you know, a few people getting an email who subscribe to an emailing list within the organization is not how they work. Um, they want a predictable and regular release candidates. They want to have their content delivered formally, for instance, as a PDF. I'll come back to that. Um, and they consume passively. So rather than actively reaching out and, and noticing changes and, and putting information down, um, they want to be told about it. Um, and you have to kind of meet people halfway here. So you can introduce them to the tools, um, but you're going to have to be more proactive and, and, and more sensitive to their um, organizational culture and how they work. Communication style, this is quite often. So we make heavy use of, of, of um, support tickets for our API community, but I've just discovered that um, some people, some cultures prefer person-to-person -person relationships. So someone will reach out to, to me directly because they know me, uh, or they reach out to the trainer who gave them some training rather than raising the support ticket. Um, and actually, the people are not familiar with support desk software and processes, which leads to some interesting problems. Um, so. For instance, um, often they will treat a support ticket as an email thread and just keep asking more and more questions rather than teach, treating each support ticket as a as a individual question, which is the way that, that I'm used to doing it and we're used to doing it in PaperCut. Um, people who, who don't feel confident speaking to me in English will send long PDF attachments, uh, which, which uh, work, but, but again, take more effort to respond to, to you know, to actually answer specific questions contained in the PDF, you've got to extract the text and do all this sort of thing. So it does take longer. Uh, and often public forums, YouTube, are blocked by IT pro are, are blocked by IT policies. People are not allowed to join these types of, of sort of interactive forums. So that may not be uh, available to you either. Um, if you want to distribute PDFs, we actually have a tool called QR Doc. It's free. I'm not selling this. Uh, it just might be useful for you. Um, it actually allows you to generate and post out PDFs. Um, so that's quite a good way of releasing PDF documents to people who want them. Um, so I give it a whirl. OK, uh, how am I doing for time? Yeah. So uh, I'm not going to go through this, but I added a little bunch of uh, references and resources. So please feel free to come back and use those. As I said, this is a big topic, requires quite a bit of analysis uh, or, or some reflection by yourself. So, so you know, I can't cover that in 30 minutes. So please do come back and read these things. I uh, hope you find them useful. And uh, thank you very much.
Do you have any questions? Thank you, Alec. Yes, um, I have one while people are typing theirs. Um, which uh, you said that you, you mainly uh, work with the Asian market, if I understood that correctly? Um, it, it comes and it ebbs and flows. Uh, so historically, I have, I have spent a lot of time working with large individual partners in Japan, for instance, mm -hmm. and as well as um, Singapore, India, and so on. Uh, but I also have partners in, in America and Europe. Um, I, I guess the reason I mentioned that is because, you know, culturally, it, it takes more effort to communicate with, with folks uh, outside of Europe and, and America because of some of the issues I've just talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so. And which, uh, yeah, I, 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 which languages in Asia do you translate the, the paper cut API docs to? I don't, I don't translate anyone. Uh, so for some reason, I mentioned that historically I've not found it to be particularly useful, but I do know that people take my material and post it in. So I try to make the material as simple as possible. So it does work in Google Translate. I'm not sure how successful mm -hmm. that is. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know the people in Japan, for instance, do a lot of that. And they also do it, even do it with my emails. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, if, if we wanted to translate it, we You'd have to translate it into about four or five different languages. And of course, there's also you know European languages. I mean, well, we translate some of our user content into German and French and so on, but we can't realistically dedicate resources to doing that for the API docs. The community is just not big enough, mm -hmm. so, so the ROI is not there. Mm -hmm. Next question: What tool do you use to make sure that the rules in the style guide are being respected? So, in case of API docs and other kinds of docs like blog posts. And uh, yeah, there will be more questions later. Okay. Uh, so there's things like Alex, which for instance, checks for profanity. Um, there's also um, uh, other things that, that check for poor sentence structure. To be honest, I haven't automated that into our tool chain. But our tool chain is undergoing a big change at the moment. Um, so I will be adding that in, but not at the moment. Uh, but I have used tools like Alex in the past. Mm -hmm. the, the the Google search term is linting for natural language because they're called lint, you know, linters, those of you that aren't developers, are tools that pick up problems in, in programming languages, pick up syntax errors or dubious usage. So uh, documentarians have started using the term linting for natural language. So that's a good Google, Google search term. Mm -hmm. Um, do you test the code snippets as well within the docs? And how do you do that if you do so? Um, I don't, I pick up a first sample code. I tend to, I tend to have, have, so I use a sample, I have a sample solution that I know works. So therefore it's syntactically correct and it's semantically correct. And then I just, so that works. And then I just extract examples from that code or even just reference uh, the sample directly. Uh, because example hosted on on um, on you know git uh, cloud services mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me um so i could just reference it that way so i don't mm -hmm. yeah i don't tend to to inline the code mm -hmm. mm. so there is a question about api documentation uh uh, from Salman and he's saying that he's using Redoc. Uh, Salman, if you don't mind, I'm going to uh, ask that uh, this question is, is put aside because that would be about this vendor over the other. Um, another question. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Salman. Uh, by the way, um, this is a, a, a constant question at the, the Rydidos community as well. Uh, which tool to use? I'm, I'm very purposefully trying to um, to keep our conversations in this conference more about practices rather than about yeah. tooling solutions. Um, however, uh, Alec, you said that you have some resources that you could put point the audience towards, right? Um, that so is uh, supporting in, this presentation. So that's in the slide. So mm -hmm. no, I, that would I was be the, told the slides are going to be provided after the event. So uh, the, the, links, the links are on the slide. If that's if, mm -hmm. if not, I can post the link with with the mm -hmm. slide so people can access it directly. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, we have a little bit more time. Um, do you have any cautionary tale um, specifically for API docs localization translation um, when it comes to Asian languages? Like, is there some specific people always mistranslate that one word? Uh, no, I don't. Um, but so, so I, th I, I struggle to find justification for doing the translation because it's it's quite hard. And particularly, you know, API documentation is extremely detailed. You have the reference stuff, you have the explanatory stuff, you have, co you know, code snippets or comments in codes. So there's a wide variety of content that's very hard to translate. And typically, unless you're a sort of a stripe or a zero, the audience for API documentation is quite small mm -hmm. compared to, for instance, the, the, the audience for your user manual. So try getting, getting the, getting the, finances and resources to actually do that translation i i'd be interested to know who, who's been able to do that that's not a you know hasn't got a huge developer community i mean papercut is not selling um so so i should have probably said this right at the beginning papercut does not sell developer tooling or developers things we we sell a product that's that's used by end end users so it's actually for print management so yeah people just control and manage their mm -hmm. printing with it but um, we, we do have an API so that people can, customers can, you know, integrate it with the other uh, systems in their IT thing, but it's not what we're about. So it's kind of, so, you know, it's valuable. Our customers like it. We like doing it for them. Um, we're, we invest in it, but it's not who we are. Whereas, you know, for, for organizations, for instance, like Slack and, and others who have, you know, the developer community is key to their financial success, as it were, it's front and center. Um, then the, the resourcing for, for that sort of translations work and other, other work is much greater and, and the, 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 you know, the, it's different. Mm -hmm. So I can't really speak to, to that because I can't justify, justify it. For, for, and I think, I think actually most people, most developer or, or most organizations that develop software are in the same situation that I am in that in that they're developing a piece of domain specific software and the API is something they're providing to to add additional value to the to the thing but it's not their their core value proposition mm -hmm. does that make sense yes um you were uh, mentioning controlled natural languages in your presentation yeah. and well that was really cool to hear about um so uh Dimitri is asking if um somebody um, wants to be sure that what they have written is indeed written in plain language, plain English, for example. Is there like yeah. objective indicators to check for this that you're not subjected to be saying like, yeah, sure, this is plain English and then maybe it's because you're native. Is there any ways to That's see? That's a good question. There are, there, are, there, are, there are some of these natural language linters which can manage, manage things like the reading level. So they can actually measure objectively things like the FOC index and the reading level. Uh, often those cost money, uh, but they are available. There are some free and open source versions as well. Again, grep for linters for natural language or linters for documentation. You, you should find some references. Um, I have a cop out. I, I speak English, so I can do some of that myself. Uh, I think if you, if English is not your first language, uh, then it's much harder. Um, but I think then you just think, well, can I understand this? Hmm. Um, but, but again, I mean, English language, and again, it's quite interesting looking at people from the sub, and I, you know, it seems mean to single people out, but people from the subcontinent use English in a very different way to the way that people in, in Australia, America, and, and UK do. And, and we find it har harder sometimes to, to read English written written in some Indian subcontinent than we do because English is written differently. It's actually um, uh, an older, you know, structure, the sentences are structured differently and, and use longer words sometimes. So mm -hmm. there's no easy answer, um, but there are some tools out there, some of which you have to pay for. Mm -hmm. um, Dimitri uh, clarified that he specifically meant um, real-time um, help with that, like while he's writing the docs, do you use a, a um, 
I don't know. Okay. I don't personally, uh, but I speak what I what I, I I I tell myself I speak reasonably good English, um, or write reasonably good English. Uh, there are so some of these tools I mentioned uh, or, or or alluded to. I didn't specifically mention them. Do have plugins for VS Code um, and and other editors, so that is good. Um, I I yeah. So so again. Google them, and, and some of them do have VS Code plugins. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a Node module, often it'll work both ways. So it'll work interactively. So there might be a plugin written for your editor. Um, and I'm, here, of course, I'm talking about Docs code. So I'm assuming the people who use writing now what markup like my other's proprietary binary formats, like Microsoft Word, um, and they also have a batch mode so you know i have integrated uh tools into uh, docker containers for instance and made it part of the validation process before documents are published to, to run mm -hmm. some of the linting tools uh as i said it's not so current do but it's something i will probably do later i've done it in the past mm -hmm. i like that. thank you very much um, most especially that you stayed up so late uh, for this presentation. And um, as I said, um, we are going to be able to publish uh, the slides, uh, a short recap uh, for, uh, you know, Google Translate uh, <laughs> on, on the site. And uh, at the end of the, um, the conference session, I will, uh, I will show uh, the links where you can reach this. Also in the um, API Docs newsletter, we're going to send you out the reminder that this has been published. Thank you very much again. That was my, my great pleasure. And if anybody's got any questions they want to follow up with me, then Twitter or LinkedIn are probably good methods of doing it.